Hello there, I'm Rob Jennings from the Dyscalculia Network, and today I'm delighted to have Patricia Babsey, who's the co-author of the Dyscalculia Assessment and the Dyscalculia Solution, plus a number of other really important books. She's a, been a specialist math tutor for many years, working in both the private and the public sector. And I welcome her here today to hear her views on maths anxiety. Hi, Patricia. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this very important and terribly sad subject, because maths is basically the way we make sense of the world around us. And you see little children tiny ones, exploring, having fun, intrigued about looking for patterns and all the things that start forming maths. And sadly, in my experience, for many of them, by the time they're seven, they have started developing anxiety about maths. And from the adults I've taught as well, you know, they will say this carries on for the lifetime, but they can all pinpoint a point in a primary classroom where things started to go wrong. So I know that other experts are talking on what maths anxiety is. So I thought I would look at the sort of basics from a teaching point of view. What are the behavioral signs? The first thing is when I see a new pupil is I look at things like their fingernails. Do they chew their nails? Sometimes you had chewed cuffs. Can they look you in the eye? And so often they just look cowed and sad. So I st always start a session with something that's just a bit fun and quirky. It might be, oh, can you catch a beanbag? Um, anyway, then, you know, start talking about ideas. But what I'm going to do first is look at some of the other behavioral signs, which of course are in the way the children behave in the classroom. And one of them, is to have tantrums. And I'm focusing on specific examples or amalgamations of children. So Sam was a 10 year old and he would sit down looking angry and fairly quickly into a lesson, he would slam the chair back, pound the desk and run out of the classroom. Now this is a classic response of to the fight and flight response. He embodied both. And this is a reaction of, to anxiety. Um, another child, Joe, but in answer to the question, tell me what happens in the maths classroom. He told me, the teacher says we all have to finish the exercise at the same time. I get scared because I can't read as quickly as the others. Then she bangs her finger in front of me and says, there it is, can't you read it? That when she does that, I can't see or hear anything. Now that is the classic freeze response and is actually outside the control of the pupil. It happens at a neurological level and your brain at that point, it closes down and you are effectively blind and deaf. And to me, the sad, a very sad aspect of that is if it happens repeatedly, you get the Pavlovian response, which means that somebody simply has to say the word maths and you will go into this frozen state. And then there's another one. He was a 12 year old, Adam, who was battling with very, very basic things like odd and even, although he was hugely articulate and excelled in other subjects. And he said to me, one of the problems is his father helped him with maths. And he said, dad says to me, I know you can do it if you just try. What he doesn't understand is that I can't do it and I just feel I'm letting him down. And so, anyway, that's just a summary of the sort of um, a few individuals. But if I could just say what the, you know, um, I did with each one. Yeah, please. Um, firstly, with Sam, fortunately, he, he come to the school I was working in from one which couldn't control him. And it had the most marvelous ethos. And so the headmistress understood that punishment was inappropriate. And so when I took over teaching him, 
we would start in the classroom when he couldn't cope and ran we'd go out into the playground and the one place he he finally found a place he wanted to learn and that was sitting on the climbing frame which was a little chilly in winter but anyway he gradually started to calm down was able to learn the basics and you know finally managed to get his sats and things joe whose teacher used to thump her hand on the table uh, we also solved the problem but or when i say solved the problem i mean got to the point where he could start to learn when i spoke to the teacher who was horrified by her behavior she had no idea she was having this effect so she changed her behavior and we were able to start down the long slow road and it is a slow road to getting him confident with maths and the same went for Adam when I explained to his father what the effect was um, he was mortified again changed his behavior and was then able to work with his son so I just give those as sort of examples of the kind of starting points we're at I'm, I'm sure that uh, a lot of teachers uh, listening to this will um, have similar experiences. Um, are, do you have any other general thoughts in this area, Patricia? Well, the thing is that you always need to start the teaching at the point where the understanding has broken down. And I know it sounds ridiculous to a lot of people, particularly if you're teaching adults, but you go right back to the beginning with counting and it's not a question mechanically counting, but it's just talking about what it actually represents, using objects, drawing diagrams. And I'm sure most of the people listening to this will have heard of Cuisinaire rods and Dean's equipment. And one adult, I mean, somebody who was lecturing on another subject in higher education, burst into tears after about five lessons and said, I never realized it could be that much fun, um, which is so sad. Yeah. Anyway, th this is, so the mass teaching should be enjoyable. It doesn't have to be laugh out loud, but give them something they are confident with and model and talk about what they're doing because you're developing concepts and too much teaching is done as procedures. So yeah. all, all they're doing is, filling in a worksheet. Now, if you do not understand what the question you're being asked is, and it might be something like three plus seven, which you know people just can't understand, that somebody can't do it. Um, but it's the fear that is blocking you from being able to deal with it at all. But if you can model it, then you start developing understanding and overcoming the fear. That's great. Thank you very much, Patricia. That's really, really useful. And uh, anything you're working on in the future? No, one thing I would like to comment on is the position we've got to now. And I, I wish somebody, you know, maybe not in this um, mass awareness thing, but somebody should start looking at this question of excellence because everywhere we're told that the goal is excellence. Now, if you actually think of what excellent means, it means you are superior. Your performance is superior to other people. Now, if everybody is going to be excellent, and that is the goal, that makes no sense at all. You can only be excellent if somebody is not excellent. And it worries me that a lot of people fall for this, you know, particularly students, because they don't think, won't have thought this through, that it's a ridiculous goal because only a few people can achieve it. I mean, it's like saying um, in the Olympics, we're going to run a race and you've all got to match Mo Farah. Yeah. People would think that you were completely bats. And yet that's what nonsense we're putting into people's heads. And, you know, the other... Um, iniquitous thing about this is what at the same time as saying everybody must be excellent if people put in a whole lot of work and do better in exams then people say no there are too many people who are getting high grades 
Mm. And it happened a few years ago when GCSEs were downgraded after the exams had been taken. Yeah. So you can't, th there's a whole conflict in education which needs to be sorted out. And rarely it should be a question of competence rather than excellence. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, and on that, actually, th there's a book called Excellence, Can We Be Equal and Excellent? written by John Gardner many years ago, who was Secretary of State for Education in America. And I think that is well worth reading because it's looking at where some of these problems come from and the social effects. Okay. Thank you very much, Tricia. Well, thank you. I hope it goes well. <laughs> thank you. See you soon. Bye.